when, when I got the invitation to come, and, and I don't do as many conferences as I used to, there are just so many, I looked at the lineup, and, and it really was quite impressive, and I haven't been disappointed. Uh, it's really been a terrific conference. Uh, I've enjoyed the presentations, but equally so, getting to know you. We've had some offline conversations, and typically the benefit of the conference, to me, ultimately becomes the exchange of conversations, and I know we've got a couple more days to spend together, and I hope we can continue that dialogue. Um, so I know, you know, I know we just had lunch, we're day three, uh, you know, you're feeling a little tired, you're going, the last thing I want to do is go to a physics class, a biology class, a philosophy class, Jesus, what are we going to do with this day? But I want to assure you we're going to have fun. And, and the anecdotal evidence that I have is that this now seems to be kind of a timely topic. I've been studying liberal arts investing for 20 years, and I'll kind of walk you how I got there. Um, but you begin to see certain evidence that things are changing, and, and, and my observation is that liberal arts investing becomes popular when things get hard. As complexity in markets go up, people are struggling to figure out things. Perhaps what they thought they knew, how it worked, doesn't work. Things are getting uh, more challenging, and so they begin to think, maybe there's something that I don't know, I need to think about things differently. And I'm beginning to see that in the last year. Um, uh, the past spring, I go to the Berkshire meeting every year, and I lecture out there at the University of Nebraska in Creighton, and it's always about Buffett. You know, they always, you know, what's Buffett doing? It's kind of like, you know, we, we've gotten this written down, we know what we're doing. This year, though, it was liberal arts. Creighton University, which, you know, terrific turnout and a big auditorium, I thought it was going to be the Warren Buffett way, and they said, no, let's do investing in last liberal art. And the kids had these last liberal art books uh, that I've written. Um, I, you know, getting to know Bill, an alumnus of Villanova, I lecture twice a year there. It's always Buffett. This year, the honors class is investing in the last liberal art. So something's perkling up. And then you see Schwartzman, Stephen Schwartzman, give $150 million to Oxford to combine the humanities together into one building, which I would assure him is not a good idea. If you ever put a philosophy teacher with a history teacher and a psychologist, you put them in the same room, it's problematic. They all get on each other's nerves. But it's, it's an interesting idea. And then my colleague, Bill Miller, um, who I worked with at 14 years. He is a liberal arts major. He did his PhD, absent his dissertation in philosophy. Just gave 11 figure investment uh, endowment to Johns Hopkins in philosophy. And I said, what the hell do philosophy people need with, the, with $100 million? So I can build a Greek temple or something and get underneath it and think about it. And he said, no, no, this is very, very important. So, so there's something going on, and I, and, I wanna, and I agree with that. I mean, I've always felt that it was a, a good long-term way in which to think about life and investing. But let me kind of get us started here. This is how it got started for me. Uh, I wrote The Warren Buffett Way in 94, and uh, it, it did well coming out of the gates. It was the first book that basically talked about how Warren picked stocks. And, and what we did was, through all the annual reports and everything, we just distilled out the major tenants, uh, the management tenants, the business tenants, the financial tenants, and we had them blocked out, and then we simply took the stocks that he had bought over the years and, and looked at how they lined up. Did that make sense? And luckily they did very well. And the stock did, you know, and the book did, did pretty well, but I messed up. The one thing I didn't talk about was portfolio management. I think I said something like, you know, he buys a few stocks and holds them forever. That was the essence of the portfolio management book. And so after the book came out, um, I began to hear on CNBC and different things, everybody seemed to have the Buffett talk down. You know, I buy good businesses, good economics, and I buy them cheaply, and I hold them forever, and I go, well, geez, they must have read the Warren Buffett way and the Berkshire shareholder, you know, that's exactly what. Then you look at the portfolio, it's 100 plus stocks and 100% turnover ratio. <laughs> and you go and say, well, wait a minute, uh, you, you've got the talk down, but you're not doing the walk. You know, you're not, you're not managing the portfolio. So I wrote a book five years later called The Warren Buffett Portfolio. And it, it basically did nothing about stock selection, but did everything about portfolio management. And what we did in that book was, you might remember, the, we mentioned it earlier in the conference, the super investors of Graham and Doddsville. I had a section called the super investors of Buffettville, where I looked at everybody that had concentrated portfolios and low turnover. And it was Bill Ruane's Sequoia Fund. It was Charlie Munger had his partnership. It was you know, John Maynard Keynes, who was actually the very first focused investor. And we kind of walked through that. And, and we did computer simulations, and we called it focus investing. Now, today, it's called high active share. I think Kremers and Petajusto have basically solved that problem for us, that if you're going to outperform the market as an equity guy, high active share has got to be involved somewhere, and probably low turnover as well. But then we had this chapter on Charlie Munger, and I didn't talk about him a lot, 
in the Warren Buffett way. And Charlie's a fascinating guy. And um, we've not only talked about his investment performance, but we talked about some of his philosophy. And we began talking about this worldly wisdom lecture that he did in 1992 at the University of Southern California, in the Professor Babcock's class, about how you unite mental models from uh, different disciplines. And in doing so, you'll get much smarter. So when the Warren Buffett portfolio book came out, we went to the annual meeting. I'm sitting right here next to my publisher, Miles Thompson. And in those days, Charlie would, someone would say, Charlie, what are you reading? Because every year you want to know what Charlie's reading. And he would get up there and, and list a few books of what he was reading. Um, and so it was, Charlie, you know, what are you reading? And you hope maybe he's going to mention your book. And he goes, yeah, well, I read Hackstrom's book, The Warren Buffett Way, and I didn't think very much about it. <laughs> and of course, my publisher went, well, we're dead. This is it. Our careers are over. Never mind, it actually had sold a lot of copies. He goes, well, he didn't do anything that Warren hadn't already told you. And that was true. I mean, I basically broke new ground. I did not break any new ground. It basically was just reorganizing what Warren had said and lining it up with American Express and Coke and the rest of them. So he was right about that. But then he went on to say, well, his new book, this portfolio book, I think that's a pretty good book. You should read it. And of course, you know, blood comes back and you know, <laughs> you're breathing again. And I, and I saw him in the airport. This is the time where he was still flying commercial, and we left at the same time. He was heading back west, and I was going back to Philadelphia. And um, I said, Charlie, thanks very much, and can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You know, he's, he's, he's a really nice guy, but he just has no time, and he's gruff. And he goes, yeah, you know, you're on the right path. Get going, you know, that type of thing. So I took it upon myself to say, OK, what is this mental model thing? <clears throat> We're going to figure this out, and it has to have practical value. I just can't say, look, it would be great if you knew a lot about physics and biology. We have to unite this mental model concept into practicality. We've got to tell you that if you study this model, this is how it works in markets. So basically what we did was we kind of outlined what I thought would be kind of the major big mental models. And of course, I start with physics because I failed it miserably in high school and college. It was the hardest. That along with chemistry, I had no idea. But it absolutely was the right place to start. Uh, for modern portfolio theory, let me tell you, that's the first mover. And if you go back and you think about physics, the reason why physics is, is, is so dynamic and so powerful, and not dynamic, powerful, is that its sense of, of precision, its sense of predictability, to get to that last decimal point. And that was what the Newtonian revolution is. So if you go back to 1666, animus mirabilis, the miracle year, you know, he knocks out colors, flexions, he does calculus, he does gravitation, all in that summer. And it, but it was the second law of motion where for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, set up the whole idea of equilibrium. And then you can then look at equilibrium in the second law of motion, and it just basically comes all the way through modern portfolio theory today. And it comes all the way through the economic textbooks, all the way, and we show how that this works out. But then um, we begin to kind of come up to present speed and begin to see that there is something that's just not making sense. This is a lecture that President, uh, soon to be President Woodrow Wilson did in, in a series of lectures called The Constitutional Government. And he says, you know, I'm reading it to you, every sun, every planet, every free body in space of heavens is kept in place. Uh, you know, the, it, it swings with equal order and precision. It's governance, uh, themselves governed by nice poise and balance of forces, uh, universe in symmetry, perfect adjustment. And you go, yeah, that's Newton. I got it. But then the other part of the lecture is, though, is that the trouble with the theory is that government is not a machine, but a living thing. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It's not accountable to Darwin. It's, it is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. And this is 1908. Okay, I, I get it. You know, government is a living thing. People are alive in government, and that makes all sense to me. But this was the knockout punch. So Alfred Marshall would be the Paul Samuelson equivalent. This is the eighth edition of the economics textbook that everybody read if you wanted to get into economics and accounting or whatever. And he says, that, and here it is, <laughs> 1920, eighth edition. The mecca of the economist lies in economic biology rather than in economic dynamics. But biological conceptions are more complex than those of mechanics. That's true. We must therefore give a relatively large place to the mechanical analogies. OK, so 100 years ago, Alfred Marshall says, you know what? I know we're using this Newton thing, but that's not the way it works. 
But Newton's the easiest thing that we got going, so let's just stay on that path. And that's where we are today. And that really, you know, when I thought about that, I went, man, that is really kind of bizarre. That we know that it's not right, we know it's not the predictability that we say it is, but because we got nothing else, and the problem with biology, as we'll learn in a minute, is we don't have the Newton of the grass plates. We don't have someone in biology that can make that precision calculation that Newton did with the planets. We're not there yet, and I don't know if we'll ever be for some time. So Chesterton, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who we'll meet in a minute, uh, who wrote detective stories, I think helps me understand better why we're so conflicted. He says the real trouble with this world of ours is not that it's unreasonable, or even that it is reasonable. The commonest kind of trouble is that it's nearly reasonable, but not quite. Life is an Ill illogicality, yet it's a trap for logicians. It looks just a little more mathematical and regular than it is. Its exactitude is obvious, but its exactitude, inexactitude is hidden. Its wildness lies in the way. I love that line, its wildness lies in the way. So what he's saying is, as you look at the world, it does look Newtonian, but not all the time. And it's when it doesn't look Newtonian, then you've got to go, OK, what's going on here? And so we're kind of conflicted. We've got Marshall saying, we've got nothing else better to work with, so we'll just stay on the Newtonian path. But at the same time, we look at the world and go, yeah, it looks Newtonian, but a lot of times it doesn't. So what do we do? So uh, you know, you've got to then jump over to, to biology. And there's the guy. And you start noodling in, uh, uh, in biology. And, and Basically, my favorite, one of my favorite lines here, Clyde, this is, you know, basically the problem that we have in every, every problem that we have, whether it's in this conference or any other conference, is based on this. It's a classic line, no man ever steps in the same river twice, or it's not the same river and it's not the same man. But every comparative analysis that we do in investing assumes differently. And we'll talk about the non-stationarity of data, which is a big pet peeve, as you've heard me say maybe a couple of days ago. It really drives me crazy. The problem that we have is Newton does not work here. Okay? And we're driving money as if this is not true. But this is really how the world works. And I'll give you Emmanuel Derman, who's a tremendous quant mind, who says in physics you're playing against God, and he doesn't change his laws very often. Carbon atoms are very predictable. You know, you can run the model over and over again with carbon atoms, and I assure you they'll behave the same way today, next week, next year, 10 years from now. But then he goes on to say, in finance, you're playing against God's creatures, agents who value assets based upon their ephemeral opinions. And that's the issue. Okay, so if you jump into the rabbit hole of biology and stock markets, a lot of things begin to jump out at you. First thing you want to know about biology is that they are really more akin, when you begin to do the metaphorical analogy and the descriptions, they're really more akin to biology and physics. First of all, they're non-equilibrium systems. It's not the law of second motion. Not every action has an equal reaction. Sometimes big, big actions in the market can have no consequence. Sometimes, like the sand pile metaphor, one little grain hits the pile and the whole thing rushes down. So you can have that. Negative feedback loops work in physics. The system gets out of whack, it comes back. I know the beginning of security analysis is the same thing. That which has fallen will come back, that which is great will, you know, it's reversion to the mean that we think is the essence of how money works. It's not. What we have is what's called positive feedback loops. Living systems are positive feedback loops. They change, they evolve, they differ. The mean is not stable, the system learns and adapts. So then the question is, okay, where do we go? And I got a head start because when I was working with Bill for 14 years, Bill Miller, uh, he took me out to Santa Fe, New Mexico to study at the Santa Fe Institute. If you ever have a get chance, go on the website, it's fascinating, it will give you the entire gloss of how to think about the economy, stock markets as a complex adaptive system. And what you want to pay attention to is this name, Phil Anderson, and the second name, Ken Arrow. Phil Anderson won the Nobel Prize in uh, physics. Um, Phil basically was looking at emergent property of physical systems, where he could see the behavior of the total system, but when he divided it into its subsequent parts, they didn't exhibit that behavior. It was only when they were put together that something differently happened than what individually happened. At the same time, Ken Arrow, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, 
for what was called endogenous growth theory, began to say, you know, this system starts to pick up speed when we add human capital, innovation, technology, and put those things in the pot, and there's not an equilibrium system here anymore. <laughs> this thing is, is acting non-equilibrium. So they get together and they start talking. And they said, you know what? I think this system has emergent properties. And Ken Arrow says, yeah, I think this thing's nonlinear. And they go, you know what? That's what the economy and the market is. And they write the first book. And the Santa Fe Institute basically was given life by John Reed in 1992 when John Reed lost all his money in South American bonds. He was so pissed off at his economists, he says, you guys don't know what you're doing. Heard about Ken and Phil and said, I'll fund them. And for the last 30 years, these guys have been hard at work trying to help us understand that the Newtonian model, which drives all the way through modern portfolio theory, does not do a good job of telling us what's going on, even though it's a workable model that we use. And we've got to begin to think about it differently. So where we go is classical economics, and we get into Keynes and Minsky, we know that. But now the full blown is to try to think about it as a complex evolving system. It's a great book if you want to read it in layman's terms. Uh, a really terrific book, and kind of will it take off on the origin of wealth, uh, which was noticeable. But what we need now is a new paradigm in economic thinking, and this is the problem. That guy is Thomas Kuhn. How many of you read Thomas Kuhn's Theories of Scientific Revolutions? Good. Anybody else? Okay. Well, you know what the problem is, right? We think that science basically solved things as uh, rational gentlemen. Can I say gentlemen? Is that politically? Gentle people? How do I say it? Gentlemanly like? What is that now politically correct? They solved it basically because we're trying to figure out what's going on for the best of what we're doing. We're trying to do better. And Kuhn says in theories of scientific revolution, it is not like that at all. What happens is you get an existing paradigm. That paradigm is supported by people who basically have gone to school, have gotten their education and their PhDs, who now have a business. Their intellectual capital, their financial capital, their emotional capital is tied up in this paradigm. Then you get a new paradigm. And these are the new people who say, you know what, I don't think your paradigm works very well. I think my paradigm is better. And I have a conflict with you. And then you get the thing called paradigms in collision. How do we solve that? <laughs> Max Planck. <laughs> Science advances one funeral at a time. And that's basically what's happening. Basically, you're seeing a force starting to bubble up. And we're going to hear it tomorrow, I think. Um, uh, Larry Siegel's coming in with Roger Ibbotson. He's got that, I uh, was reading that monograph, uh, Popularity Asset, uh, Modern Portfolio Theory thing they're doing, which they referenced this book, which is basically Andy Lowe at MIT that's trying to bridge the gap. He's trying to get you to take Newton and Darwin and push them together. And that's where we are. So we have a lot of people in modern portfolio theory land who have gotten their PhDs, who've built big businesses, who've got a lot of AUM, and they've driven the model that way, and they're not interested in this. <laughs> this is very threatening to them. And so this will take, I think, a long time, decades, for us to work it out. And what will eventually happen is the younger of the profession will begin to say, I buy into Andy Lowe's view, not the old view, and as the younger people become more of the populace and the old view become less part of the populace, the pendulum will begin to shift. Um, as I said, when you hang out with Bill Miller uh, for 14 years, I can't believe how much philosophy we read at Lake Nation Capital Management. Uh, but it was almost every single day, it seems like everybody was talking about philosophy one way or the other. Two big philo philosophical questions. Ontological, it's unexplainable, you'll never know. <laughs> you'll never get it figured out. My view is, if you run into an ontological question, just move on, <laughs> you know, unless you've got time to noodle on that for a long time. But most of the problems we have are epi epistemological, which is really based on a question that you can figure out, but it's only limited by your ability to understand it. And so Alexander Pope writes, disorder is nothing more than order misunderstood. And Bill's favorite uh, philosopher is Wittgenstein, Austrian. Uh, I think it's really cool that you get your face on a stamp. That's why I use it. <laughs> I just thought it was pretty. But basically, Wittgenstein is a language philosopher. He believes all problems in philosophy are based upon a linguistic misunderstanding. 
Before I get into that, though, something that's relevant to us in markets is this quote from Culture and Value. When we think about the future of the world, we always have in mind it's being where it would be if we can move as we see it moving now. We do not realize that it moves not in a straight line and that its direction changes constantly. That's the stock market. That's the economy. And basically what uh, Wittgenstein was saying, and we now fully realize it, is that we are linear animals. What we see today is what we project will happen tomorrow. We kind of draw a line from yesterday, today, to next, and that's where it's going to be. But the economy, the stock market being a living system, has a lot of ebb and flow. And so as you basically, and this was the old analogy, this is the 1990s, most technology works in S-curves. It begins to happen. We don't really recognize it or we don't think it's a big deal. So your expectations of what's going to happen stay somewhat rooted on nothing really dramatically going to happen. But then it starts to arc, arc, arc. And what happens? Your expectations move, but it's always late. And there's your gaps, right? So there are the profit gaps. Uh, if you're smart enough to know where the red line is relative to expectations, that's your excess return if you're long or vice versa when the bus rolls over. But, uh, and we see it in hyperbolic discounting all along. I mean, this is a problem in our shop all along. Everybody just takes me to the last data point and says that's the way the world is going to be. You over, over emphasize the last GDP report, the last earnings report, whatever it is, you anchor to that. Uh, it's a very bad thinking flaw. Okay, but the important thing, and I'll give you the uh, story behind it, is that Wittgenstein it's all, said it's always a problem of language. The words that you choose, the words that you choose for anything give something meaning. And that meaning ultimately becomes the explanation. So how does this work? Okay, in philosophical investigations right in the middle of the narrative, he, write, he just draws a little triangle. He says, tell me what this is. Well, I say, it's a triangle. Most of you would. But he says, well, yeah, it could be, but it could also be seen as a triangular hole. You're actually looking down through it. It's a solid, a geometrical drawing, standing on its base, hanging from an apex. It could be a, a mountain, a wedge, an arrow, a pointer, an overturned object, a shorter side of a right angle, a half parallelogram, and various other things. How many descriptions did he come up with for this simple geometric drawing? So then I ask you, how many descriptions can you come up for a company that you own? Okay, so um, one of the, the things that Bill did in the 1990s was to understand the economic compounding effect of negative working capital as it was occurring in Dell Computer. Dell Computer went up 10,000% in the decade of the 1990s, the single best investment ever made of that decade. Why did it go up? Well, when or even before the internet, you called up 1-800 and you said, Mr. Dell, I like a computer, I want this keyboard, this processor, this memory, this modem, and you know, whatever the case may be, uh, this monitor. And they said, yeah, you got it. It'll be to you in about six weeks. Can I have your credit card? They said, sure. It's the American Express. And, and he said, great, thank you. That money was in Dell's bank that night. Six weeks, two months, three months later, he paid the supplier. He basically drew, grew, grew Dell Computer on the receivables that he got from his customers before he had to pay the supplier, negative working capital. Dell Computer was the very first company to ever earn triple digit return on capital. Never ever has happened in history before. Has happened again, I'll tell you that story in a second. So Bill said at 50 times earning, I think this thing's worth a lot more. He got 8,000% on it. One of the things that I have a problem with in our industry is that something that goes up 10,000% over a decade has a 45 multiple. It's not a value investment. Really? <laughs> You're telling me something goes up 10,000% for a decade? That's not a value proposition? Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> that thing went up a lot. Okay? So then we rolled Dell into AOL. We'll talk about that. Then we rolled AOL into Amazon. We got it before the crash. Uh, and we owned it afterwards. Today in Opportunity Trust, Bill can show me on his ledger, he still has Amazon at $3 a share in some position. So we said, okay, let's go take a look at Amazon. And he puts us on the plane, we go out and see Jeff, and Jeff, this is you know early in Jeff, where uh, you know the station wagon with the wife and the books, and it's all true story. 
And we walked through the model and, and, and Bill, uh, Jeff knew Bill's reputation and he got Dell right and he did all these things with AOL and it's kind of like this value guy's got it figured out. And, uh, and so we were talking around and so Bill says to Jeff, what's the business model? And Jeff said, it's Dell. And we went, we're home. We got it. We didn't need, that was the description, right? The description was Amazon was Dell. What was the description of Amazon in the market? It's Barnes and Noble. So you looked at the metrics of Barnes and Noble, low PE, price to book, dividend, whatever, and you looked at Amazon, and so the deal was, oh, Amazon is Barnes and Noble, but it's so mispriced, let's go long Barnes and Noble and short Amazon. Well, that didn't work out too well. Then they started doing kitchen appliances and you know, music and video. And so, oh no, it's Walmart. Amazon is Walmart. And so you looked at the metrics on Walmart, you looked at the metrics on Amazon, and you went, ah, get long Walmart, short Amazon. Well, that didn't work out too well. Amazon now is the second company to ever earn 100% return on capital because it's the same business model as Dell. In fact, the last quarter, it was 222% return on incremental capital. You wanna know how a trillion dollar business can become a $4 trillion business in a worldwide market cap of 72 trillion? It's Amazon. And three years ago, when Warren said, I missed it, I met with Jeff, he could be the smartest guy I ever met, I missed it. Bill wrote him a letter and said, Warren, that's up four or five more times from here. And you might know that this past year, Warren, added it, wasn't Warren, it was Todd Combs, who's been working with Jamie Dimon <coughs> at, um, and Jeff Bezos to solve this healthcare. But it's interesting that if you had the description line on Amazon and thought it was Dell, it was a no-brainer. But those that had the description that it was a brick and mortar, because that's how they saw it, failed. So the famous mathematician who passed away a couple of years ago, the inventor of fractal geometry, Benoit Mandelbrot at the Santa Fe Institute, were having a big argument, and he was a big guy, bigger than me, about 275, 300 pounds. The argument was going on, he bellicose in the back. Failure to explain is caused by failure to describe. And in that one statement, I understood immediately why I lost every argument with my wife. Because what I thought was going on was not going on. <laughs> I said, well, this is what happened. She goes, no, that's not what happened. That's what you think happened, but that's not what actually happened. So high relevance here on philosophy. William James, who would be the second poster child, uh, really talks about uh, you know, having to move on, how new facts burst old rules. This is a definite American philosophy. The Europeans hate pragmatism because Europeans operate in absolutes and pragmatism doesn't. Beliefs are man-made, they're conceptual language you use to write down our observations of nature. At the end, a belief is true as it has cash value. Gosh, if that doesn't ring true in our ears, what does? Does it have cash value? But this is what really pissed off the Europeans. Truth is not a noun. Truth becomes a verb, it's not a noun. Okay. So it's my best line in the book, I had to show it to you. So I said, well, okay, pragmatism is a process that allows people to navigate an uncertain world without becoming stranded on the desert island of absolutes. And what did I tell you about Thomas Kuhn? Paradigms are absolute visions. You hang on to that, you don't move, but that's the problem. So one of the lectures that I've been giving recently that's starting to get some pull is the evolution of value investment. So, Value does not hibernate. It does not go away. If I hear one more lecture tell me that I'm going to do real well in the market as soon as value comes back, I think I might step in front of a bus so we can definitely figure out whether you do get hit, killed by, by getting hit by a bus. This has really got to stop, guys. The paradigm of value doesn't work, it's a momentum world. We talked about this a little yesterday and I tried to get Chris to kind of flesh it out. That is a part of momentum that moves is basically value being repriced. Then we can argue at the tail of that it gets overpriced, yes. But what I think happens is that growth side of the market that you don't think is value is actually value being mispriced, I mean value being repriced in that section. 
So if you go back, Ben Graham started with net net current assets. Uh, then you couldn't find those. Then he did book value. A lot of people still anchor to book value. Although Bill Nygren said at the, Bear, at the uh, Ben Grand conference, I don't use book value anymore, which may be news to David Hero, who owns all the European banks, because that is important. And so book value is important in financials, but not much anything else, if you think about it, as an indicator. And then he wrote The Intelligent Investor in 49, which was the People Magazine version of security analysis, and gave us low factors. And so we basically grew up on this low PE, low price to book, high dividend yield, as that's the good stuff. And the high PE, no dividend yields, high multiple, that's the bad stuff. And the really smart people stay over here with the good stuff. And the speculators stay over there with the bad stuff. And we just have to wait our turn. I think that's wrong. I absolutely think that's not the way the world works. And Warren said, basically, after he bought Coca-Cola in 1998, it had the highest, it was a uh, PE premium to the market. It was a high price to book, had a below average dividend yield. He put one third of his portfolio in it, $1 billion, and the press crucified him. How dare you turn your back on the master? Ben Graham is ruling over in his grave that you've made this investment. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> one billion went to 10 billion, <laughs> and the S&P went up three times. Was that a value proposition? Absolutely. What did he figure out? Well, when Roberto Gazzietta got in there and replaced Austin, and Austin had bought a bunch of artwork and stupid investments and wine and stuff, he sold all that, and Roberto Gazzietta said, you know what, I'm just going to put it in the syrup business, which gets the highest return on capital, and keep plowing it in there, plowing it in there, plowing it in there. And the return on equity, return on equity, Coca-Cola, and we showed it in the book, just started doing this. And then you went, well, what do you pay for something that's return on capital going this way. Remember, I told you about Dell. But what happens if it goes 15 to 20 to 25? And then Rappaport, in 1986, about the same time, gives you creating share of value. Anybody read that book? <coughs> okay, it's a good book. <laughs> Thanks, Prof. <laughs> uh, that was about the same time that Stern Stewart came out with EBA. And that was actually theoretically really quite good, except they overplayed the debt side. And Warren got pissed off and said, look, you can lower your cost of capital by lowering up a bunch of debt, but that's a stupid thing to do if you're running a business. So he disavowed <coughs> Stern Stewart. But the mechanics of what Al Rappaport was talking about, which is value is created by this, how much cash comes out, and its return on capital. I think that's about it. I'm an investment snub. Snob, I should say snub. Investment snob. I finally have come to grips with that. I finally have realized why I'm so agitated. I'm a snob. I believe that there was a financial Moses. He would have come off the mountain today with one tablet and two commandments, cash and return on capital. Everything else is just a shortcut. Everything else is just trying to get you there easily. And I think that's the purest way in which to think about long-term investing, not short-term investing, you know, there are other ways in which to play. I'm talking about long horizon arbitrage, the game that I play, that Buffett plays, that Miller plays. It's really only about cash and return on capital. You figure that out, you'll figure everything else out. And I'll give you another story. Price earnings ratios do not tell you what is valuable and what's not valuable. Michael Mobison, how many of you know Michael? Um, yeah, Michael's written four books. He's probably one of the brighter things. He's actually teaching Ben Graham's original security analysis class at Columbia for the last 23 years, 27. He basically put out a paper and said, PEs are not value, they're their summation of what the business is worth. Low PE is the summation of a company that's capital intensive, low returns on capital, and slow growing. High PE is the summation of a very good business that has low capital, rapidly growing, high returns on that capital. They are the summation of what the business is, the market thinks the business is worth. They're not the key to figuring out what's profitable until you then take that price against the market's price to see if there's an expectation gap between the two. And he wrote the book with Al Rappaport called Expectations Investing, which said, look, all you gotta figure out is what is the business worth and what is the market's expectations, and that's your art. So it's time for us to get off, I think, this low PE. Now, I can say, I'll meet you halfway. You can say that low PE stocks have underperformed high PE stocks. And you're right. 
But you can't then make the assumption that low PE stocks are value stocks until you tell me what that business is worth and then what is the difference between what that business is worth and the price in the market. And if there's a big enough gap, then there could be a value proposition. At the same time, you can't tell me a high PE stock is a bad investment until you tell me what it's worth and what is the market's price and is there any expectation gap. And if it is, it is a value investment, regardless of what its price earnings ratio. Enough lecturing there. What Bill did with Amazon, AOL, uh, Google, we were the largest uh, uh, pr uh, participant in the Google underwriting. Larry and Sergey came out and said, you know, we saw what you did with Jeff. We think you're long-term investors. What did Santa Fe teach us? Well, first of all, I'll go back to what was going on with the endogenous growth theory it was nothing more than what's called increasing returns economics. That they were beginning to see things speed up that shouldn't be speeding up. And they were speeding up because the network effects, that's Microsoft, lock-in, path dependence, scaling, Jeff West's work and scaling, logarithmic, uh, normal uh, uh, types of positionings. And so Bill could see that when AOL got to where it did, it was not gonna get unseated. He then saw that how these things were laying out on the scale. When you get to the number one position, you rarely go to number four. Number one is twice as big as number two, three times as big as number three, blah, blah, but they rarely change positions. And when you knew that, and you began to think about lock-in and path dependence, lock-in with Amazon, you don't want to change all the billing, and you know how to use it, all that network effects. The bigger they get, the more valuable they become. The more uses they have, the more bigger they get. The more bigger they get, the more valuable they become. That's all network effects. And so Bill took value investing, and that's the moats today. Graham's moat was, is it trading below hard physical capital? Warren's moat was brand value. Bill's moat is network effects. That's the new brand. And I'm sorry, that's a new moat, I think, in the new economics. So this is uh, Nobel Prize uh, cutsy. Sometimes says pragmatism always beats principles. Comedy is what you get when principles bump into reality. I think in finance, it's not comedy, it's tragedy. And what you're seeing is a lot of really good shops that are still stuck on that low PE mentality are starting to see their assets run out the door. And there's a reason why. Okay, mathematics, I think, all our board of regents are having lunch today. I would say, if you're gonna do the CFA exam next year, level one needs to be this question that you understand. I can't believe we still don't know this, okay? Past averages to be meaningful, the data being average must be drawn from the same population. If it's not the case, if the data comes from populations that are different, the data are said to be non-stationary. When data are non-stationary, projecting past averages predict, uh, typically produces nonsensical results. If you show me one more graph that says this stock or this group of stocks 30 years ago were trading at this multiple, and today they're trading at that multiple, and that's wrong, or that's an arbitrage or something like that, and you don't tell me what is different between the two population sets, or better yet, if you assume that the two population sets have the same economic models, the same interest rates, the whole night, this makes no sense whatsoever why we use long historical averages to make comparisons between stocks, companies, industries, sectors, markets. If you want to use averages like that, then you have to put a little note in there and tell me why it's either the same or different. But simply to draw comparisons on averages, to me, it's nonsensical, it doesn't advance the ball whatsoever. Reading, I thought I knew how to read, I have no idea how to read. Mortimer Adler wrote a book back in 1949 before TV, which is a New York Times bestseller. We have so many books to get through. I wanted to give you strategies about how to be a better reader. The first thing you need to understand, out of every 10 books you read, probably only one of them deserve your time. But we plod through them as if it's the Holy Bible. Mortimer gives you the uh, things he says. The first thing to do is what he calls, you know, inspectional. You kind of go to the contents. You go to the footnotes. You kind of look, is there anything new here? You do a very rapid speed read. If you think it's good enough, then you slow down and you own the book. I could never do highlights and pens in book because I thought I was being disgraceful to the book and to the author. Now I own that book. It's not going to go to the library. 
I own that book. I highlight it, I make notes. Synoptical reading, though, is what you do when you basically have an idea, and we'll talk about this in a minute. When you have an idea and you want to get better at that idea, you bring in multiple books from different areas. The other thing is reading nonfiction and fictional readings. Our view is cast a net far and wide. We talked to, talk to you about philosophy. I also wrote a book about detectives, what Lauren was nice enough to mention. I grew up reading detective books. Um, I was a bellhop, did the midnight shift while I was going through college. My dad would give me the old Rex Stout paperbacks with the Nero Wolf, and I read them all summer long, so I got hooked on them. And so I started saying, well, you know, the great detectives, considered to be the great detectives, are the ones that solve all the puzzles by their mental acumen. They don't pistol whip a confession out or, you know, anything like that. They basically solve it by their mental acumen. And these are considered the three great detectives, or I should say the authors of the three great detectives. That's Edgar Allan Poe, who gave you Augusta Penn. Of course, uh, <coughs> Sir Arthur Conan Doyle with Sherlock Holmes. Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who we met in the middle, who gave you Father Brown. And so I walked through and basically kind of went through the short stories and a couple of the books and you know, kind of wrote out what is it that they're doing to solve uh, their uh, and things. And so Sherlock is great. Um, I think that second bullet, I'll come back to that in a minute, pay attention to the tiniest details. That's not just the footnotes that we know now we have to read in annual reports. It's other things, but Father Brown is your Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, detective. Basically, if you've ever seen a Father Brown mystery or read it, you think you know it, what's going to happen right up until the end, and then there's a quick pivot. All the, all the information was there for you, but he's a master at re-descriptions. And just to back up, um, we actually, for our interns and analysts that come on board, we let them read detective stories. We think, you know, it's just a good exercise. You know, they, it's kind of liberating. They kind of get, and we try to say, what did you figure out? You know, what were you saying? What were the signals and things that were going on? So now my synoptical reading is on art appreciation. And you might say, well, hell, where are you going with this? And it reminded me when I did the detective book, there was a, a doctor who taught at Yale School of Medicine. His name is Dr. Erwin Braverman. And he figured out that when his students were coming through med school, the way in which they diagnose a disease is through pattern recognition. And typically there are broad patterns that they look at. And he was finding out that, yeah, they got some things right, but they were missing a lot. And so back to the Sherlock Holmes, the tiny details. And so he divided his classes. This is, 19, this is 1998 through 2000. And he divided his class into students in, in the Yale Medical School that just basically took the normal courses. Then the other group was took the normal courses, but they added an art appreciation course. And found out those that studied art criticism basically ended up being better diagnostics, diagnosticians. They began to see things other than the broad <laughs> patterns. And when you begin to study art appreciation, this is a great book. I'm through two of the three right now, two of the five right now. A couple things jump out at you. First of all, I thought it was hilarious that the uh, museums out there have now documented that the uh, person that walks through a museum spends about 15 to 30 seconds per artwork. I was pleased. That's a little bit longer than people think about stocks or sectors before they buy an ETF. So I thought, well, man, that's not as bad as I thought. But 15, they, they read the card, they step back, okay, and they move on. Now, my art appreciation argument is, I guarantee, this is for long horizon arbitrage. And there, listen, I, I know I'm disparaging about a lot of things, but there are a lot of different games being played in the market that are really smart games. Some of them are short and microseconds, some of them are months and a year, and some of them are five and 10. If you're gonna do an art appreciation course, it's because you're going to think about a stock, like I thought about Berkshire Hathaway and other things, for a multi-year period of time. You're gonna get invested with that company, and therefore you need to really understand what's going on with that company. So art appreciation is most relevant to long-term investing, not short-term. If you're a short-term trader, uh, don't read these books. But the one thing that I came away with um, in art criticism is that uh, art, all art criticism, particularly in contemporary paintings, is all metaphorical. Metaphorical are language <laughs> analogies. Something is like this, you're making analogies. That was interesting. Ever look at a painting, look at the lines, you have a tendency to look at the broad strokes. So Schindel says, and it was great, he says, 
with every line, it starts with a point. Start at the point and watch how the line grows. And when you begin to look at a painting like that, you'll see it differently than what you would see if you just stepped back and looked at it broadly. Look at the smallest point and then look how that line starts to grow. And it really does become alive to you. Um, and, and for me, that was, that was the Berkshire. That was the Berkshire. Uh, I was a stockbroker at Lake Mason. I thought I'd made a terrible mistake at the end of my three weeks I was going to resign. I had no idea looking at a value line, investment survey, margin, price earnings. I said, this is terrible. Uh, and Thursday night, I read the Berkshire Hathaway annual report before we had to leave the next day. And it was the epiphany. It was the light bulb goes off. Because what did Warren do? He basically took numbers, which couldn't make any sense, and he put flesh on it. There were people behind that. And there, was, there were companies, whether it was Borshines and Nebraska Furniture Mart or uh, the Daily Journal, whatever the case, there were people. And then, so for me, looking at companies really became very much like looking at artwork. And in Long Horizon Arbitrage, I think that has a lot of relevance. Okay, let's wrap this up. Um, we're in a complex world. There are two logical ways to solve it. You can either reduce the world's complexity or you better improve your ability to manage it. We're not going to reduce our complexity, so we've got to get better at it. Age and mental complexity. The belief was that you, know, you plateaued mentally at the same time you did physically, and so you couldn't get any smarter after you were 25 and 30. That's not true. This is from Robert Keegan and Lisa Lasko, that basically mental complexity or the, the ability to improve your ability to solve mental complexity can happen at all different arcs of your life, young and old. This is the uh, CV on what I think are the best books in learning theory. It's in your book. So Kagan and Lasko basically set out that the development goes through three stages, the socialized mind, the self-authoring mind, and the self-transformative mind. Socialized mind. Basically, that's the CFA who just got his charter. I basically got it figured out. I want to align with others who are thinking that. I'm driven by groupthink. I'm just glad to be part of this organization, this company, whatever. That's OK. That's who I am. Self, I'm sorry. Uh, Self-authoring is that basically you begin to see people kind of step back. They're kind of aware of group thinking is going on, but they're beginning to develop something of their own personal code. Self-transformative. They definitely see limits in the ideology that's before them. They are frightened by groupthink. The questions are really no longer about the framework of the design, but the entire design itself. And so this is the best analogy in the book, three minds riding in a car. Socialized mind, they're just happy to be in the carpool, right? All they want to do is just be included. Doesn't matter who's driving, I'm just glad to be a part of the company. Self-authorizing, they're happy to be in the car too, but now they want to drive. They want to start to steer a little bit in different directions. Instead of being on the heavily traveled highways, they may seek alternate routes. But the self-transformative mind, yeah, they want to drive, absolutely. And they'll stay on the road as long as it's a good map. But if the map doesn't work, if they see the map is limiting their ability to get where they need to go, they draw a new one. They draw a new map so they can figure out where to go. And I think that's where we are. So this is not an IQ problem. Today, really, it is not about getting any smarter in our CFA world. In my mind, it's not any more smarter in MBA. It's not smarter in being financed. It really is about trying to figure out other ways in which to solve it. You have to be adaptive. Alfred North Whitehead, avoid the fatal unconnectedness of academic disciplines. Charlie, who was never short for words, specialization causes a lot of bad thinking. It's a pernicious evil. It's fatal. So I'll leave it with there. Uh, and William James will sum it up. The faculty for perceiving analogies is the best indication of genius. People who can analogize are the wits, the poets, the inventors, the scientific men, the practical geniuses. And isn't that what our clients are asking us to be, the practical geniuses? Aren't we supposed to be the smartest guys in class? That's why they give us the money. That's why they say, solve my retirement, solve my kids' education because you're really the smart guy? Well, my argument is we can be smarter. I'll leave it with that with a shameless plug for the book, and we'll stop there. How are we on time, Lauren? OK? You're on time. Great. Yep. Thank you. What do you want to talk about? I gave you a lot to push back on. Yeah? Um, I did read the um, Oh, yeah, I was supposed to. <laughs> Julie was very like, Robert, make sure they get the cue. OK, get the cue. 
I was struck by slide 24. Okay, which uh, one is that? That was uh, Ludwig... Uh, Wittgenstein, yeah. With this, sorry. Um, is, how does learning, let's say, if you, if you only know one language, yeah. how does learning, learning multiple languages, how does that impact one's thought process to look at the world and look at investing or any of that type of stuff? You know, I, that's a great question. I've never been asked that question, but you know, it just puzzles me that that's something that you need to think about, Why? Right? To what degree do other languages have different ways in which to describe things? Uh, Borges, uh, a tremendous philosopher, you know, wrote extensively. I will tell you a guy that, that's on the Santa Fe board, I don't know how many of you know Cormac McCarthy, probably the greatest living American author that hasn't won the Nobel Prize that should. If you read his border trilogies, uh, which are half in Spanish and half in English, uh, it, it's remarkable. And I don't know Spanish, but you know, I've had chances to sit down with Cormac and he walks me through a couple of things. I think you're onto something. I think the idea that if you studied more than one language, would you see things differently by knowing that second language or third language? Is that the direction you were going? Yeah, because in some languages, you can have multiple descriptions of things. And some of them, they're not, like they, someone told me that English is a language by consensus. So that we say that's a chair because everybody agrees that's a chair. Other languages, it's an extension of what you sit on. Literally, it, it comes out like that. Yeah. So, you know, so I'm thinking other languages might be might have more descriptive words and and, and different ways to, to describe stuff. Brilliant. Now you know why I like coming to this conference. I never would have thought of that. Thank you. I, I, that's brilliant. Yeah. Now I got to go take a course in Spanish or something. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Anybody? Prof, you're not going to let me get away with all that, are you? I'm a, I'm anxious to see your lecture in the morning. I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, Bill. Oh, we got to get him a cue. Okay. Can I pass him that one there? Uh, it sounds like you guys probably have spent a lot of time on some secular trends yeah. in the marketplace. Yeah. So you can't compare today versus 30 years ago. So you look at auto stocks today versus 30 years ago when there was no autonomous and things like that, it's probably yeah. not relevant. But is there a particular sector today where you're, you see a most sizable disconnect between where the market is and what your numbers are telling you? Yeah, I mean, um, and it, you, this is going to be so obvious you're going to go, you're not telling me anything, but I don't think we really grasp the magnitude of what's going on. So Warren said, look, Robert, just find easy games that are mispriced. We have a tendency in our business that the more complex it is, the more mispriced it is. That may or may not be true. But he says, you know, all I want to do is find something simple and predictable that's mispriced. The single most, well, I'll use McKinsey. The greatest growth story in the history of capitalism is occurring right now under our feet. With the migration, not migration, the evolution, not the evolution. The transi transition of poor people to middle class status in Asia. So when they said the greatest growth story in the history of capitalism, I said, well, it's got to be the Industrial Revolution. Right? It took 150 years for GDP to, to double. But that was pretty good, right? right? They said, well, no, that's not it. And I said, well, it's got to be the baby boom generation post-World War II, right? I mean, that was a lot of spin. It took 50 years to double GDP. What's going on in China and India it took 16 years? And they did it with a group of a billion people. So by McKinsey's mechanics, that is a force 1,000 times greater than what happened in the Industrial Revolution or the baby boom generation. So I'm a growth guy that likes value mispriced. And, and we do know the market will misprice sustainable growth. And it should, because I think it was Chris, I loved his factor presentation. The reason why growth is so attractive and dangerous is that if it wins, it's a multiple, two, three, four times. But the success rate in sustainable long-term growth is not high. The success rate in the value camp, if we call it that, is much higher, but the payoff is lower. So the point is, with Coke or anything, if you've got that growth model figured out, it's highly likely that the market's mispriced. So I went back and looked, and I said, well, what were the buying habits? So we, we got data from McKinsey on what were the buying habits for Asian consumers. Now, Greater Asia, there's a great book called The Future is Asian uh, by Paprag Kahan. It's a tremendous book. Asia today we have totally misdescribed. Asia really is the Middle East, it's called West Asia, to South Asia is India, to East Asia is China, 
to Southeast Asia, which is 10 countries in the Southeast Asian economy, which has 650 million people, which has an economy itself greater than India. Five billion people there. And they tell me what their spending habits were, identical to what they were for the baby boom generation. What happens when you get into discretionary income and become middle class? What is the first thing you do? You buy better tasting food. What's the second thing you do? You buy better tasting drinks, most likely alcohol, wine, beer. Third thing, household products. You want to clean up the house. Third, beauty care and health care. Fourth, it was a camera back in the baby boom generation. What is it today? Phones. Fifth, sixth, travel. When I grew up, my dad put me in that country squire Ford wagon and we went to Florida, but damn it, we traveled. What do they do now? Despite the bad news on Boeing, they get on Boeing aircraft and Airbus and they travel everywhere. So I already know what the spending habits are of the Asian consumer. All I have to do is just line up my portfolio with companies that sell products and services to 5 billion people that are coming on, then we'll have a magnitude force 1,000 greater than what we just saw in the 60s and 70s. That's got to be the easiest low-hanging fruit game I've ever seen. How do you not play that game? That's easy. Here's the problem. Oh, as a side note, we own Diageo. We're figuring people are going to buy liquor and, and beer along the way. <laughs> and I went to a Diageo meeting, and he goes, which country in the world consumes the most uh, Guinness beer? I said, Scotland. He goes, that's not a country, you idiot. <laughs> I went, okay, I got it. I went, okay. I said, Ireland. No, no. Nigeria. 180 million people in Nigeria. Half of them are Muslim. And they don't drink. Which means the other half are doing some heavy lifting. Right? <laughs> right? I mean, there's some serious drinking going on in Nigeria. The number one best-selling soap in the world. Life Boy. Remember Life Boy? I would go to camp. My dad would give me the bar of soap and that little plastic thing. I'd go to camp for six weeks and said, son, when I pick you up, that bar better be really skinny because I know you took a shower. I would take a shower every day. The damn bar never went down. It stayed the same. A week before my dad, I'm in there three times a day scrubbing, <laughs> trying to get the bar down. They sell more Life Boy soap in India than any place on the planet. So I own Unilever. Nestle, the world's largest food company. I'll tell you the other one that's a no-brainer, luxury goods. The manufacturing capacity of Louis Vuitton carrying Richemont, whatever, to deliver out soft goods, hard goods, watches, whatever, is nowhere near capable of being able to take on the demand that's coming out. There's just not enough. That, to me, is low-hanging fruit. So I think that's the most mispriced. So I'll give you this. Are we OK on time? Where are we? Oh, well, you better, guys better ask some more questions or we'll go to break. So this is what, it, what was interesting. So does long horizon arbitrage actually work? Do things actually go up over a multi-year period of time higher than what the market return is? Does that work? So I just I said to the guys, I said, all right, give me, you know, post-2008, start in 2009 through the end of 18, of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500, how many beat the market? How many of those stocks are the 500? beat the S&P 500, 161, one third of the basket. So then we started to divide them, and, and the average return of the market was 13%. And I said, okay, divide them into quadrants and give me this, positive EBA spread, earning above the cost of capital and sales growth, right? That's not a lot, right? Do you earn cash and do you earn above the cost of capital and how fast you grow? The ones that had positive EBA earning above the cost of capital and had average to below average sales growth, earned 15% average annual return. Beat the market even with below average sales growth, but they had positive EBA. I said, what are the top quadrant? The fastest growing, most positive EBA spreads average 17% per year. Okay, so that reaffirmed my Moses coming down off the mountain. Hey, Robert, it's about cash and return on capital. Then I said, tell me the distribution of the returns of those stocks. Half of them, half of them, no, I'm sorry, 60% only beat the market half the time on a frequency basis. So then you begin to ask yourself, okay, 
what were you doing with your portfolio when that stock that's going you know, up 17% average annual over the year only is beating the market half the time? What did you do with it when it didn't beat the market that year? You know damn well what you did. You sold it. My portfolio, I did this 14 years with Bill, and we did pretty well until we blew up in 2008 because we made a bad bet on political decisions, but that's another story that my therapist says I need to get over with. <laughs> um, if you look at high active share portfolios, and we did it in the portfolio book, if you look at, except for Buffett, who had a clean record from 50, 60, 69, you look at Charlie Munger, Bill Ruwain, John Maynard Keynes, Lou Simpson, all crushed the market. Their hit rate was 60%. They only outperformed on an annual basis 60%. I just finished my five year record. So I joined the new firm, Stiefel, a bunch of ex leg Mason guys got together. Uh, I run 25 stocks, low turnover ratio. I'm long multinationals of selling products and services to the emerging middle class in Asia. It's, I am happy as can be. It's no problem. I have only outperformed the market, even though I am, I've beaten the MISCI pretty handily, and I'll give you our numbers. Our, you know, we're up 47 versus that time the MISCI's up 34. Compounded average or annual return, 2% better. Net of fees, we're fine. We only beat the market half the time. 20 quarters I underperformed the MISCI. 20 quarters I outperformed the MISCI. So then you say, well, how did you do that? How did you beat the market when you're only beating it half the time? And the answer is understanding the difference between frequency and magnitude. We're so hung up on the frequency of the returns, we forget about the magnitude. It's not how many times you beat the market, less how many times you lose. It's how much money you make when you beat the market, less the money you give back when you're wrong. And so if you look at our spread, when we make money, we make pretty good. And when we give back, we don't give back so much, which I would attribute that it is that we're doing a decent job on the valuation side. So long horizon arbitrage works, but then go back to Kremers and Pettit Kremers wrote. Well, it was Kremers and Pettigrew did high active share. Then Kremers, you remember in the Financial Journal a couple of years ago, did remember he did skill, conviction, and opportunity. So we know it's high active share, and we know it's low turnover. But one, you better be a damn good stock picker, because if you run a concentrated portfolio and you're not a good stock picker, you're toast. So skill's important. Got that part figured out. Conviction. Do you have the backbone to hang in there when the portfolio goes against you? Do you have it in you to hold in there? But the third one was opportunity. Opportunity is, do you have a client base that will let you play that game? So I think I've got an easy game, massively mispriced. My challenge is trying to find people that want to play the game and give me the opportunity to do it. And our obsession with short-term pricing, I've never met anybody that disagreed with what the Warren Buffett way said. And they go, yeah, Robert, I want to manage money that way. A third of them. Six months later, going, why don't you own that? Why don't you own that? Why, did you, why are you doing this? Why, yeah, it's just amazing. They get it, but they have this innate sense that the only way that you make progress in your portfolio is through activity. If you're not buying and selling, you're not making progress. Well, your company's making wonderful progress. Cash, return on capital is doing just fine. And then I say, okay, well, do you, I'll just start buying and selling a lot. Oh, no, 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 I don't want you to do that, Robert. Well, what do you want? Well, I want you to be right every single time. Well, I can't. You know, the market ebbs and flows in popularity contest. It likes this, this time, it likes that, that time. Because re remember, the game that you're playing in the stock market is not one game against another person playing the same game. There are hundreds and hundreds of games being played simultaneously in the market, instantaneously. The, the pawns on the chessboard, which is your company going up and down in price, are moving for reasons other than the game that you may be playing. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm floating this as a theory. Think about the market, 3,000 stocks is this huge chessboard. Each company that you own is a pawn on a square, and you've got from zero to $1 up to 2,000. It's about 150 yards wide, and it's about 200 yards long. That's all the companies. And you've decided you want to play a game with a select group of pawns, and you want to advance it down the board. And yeah, you're playing against someone else who may be playing the same game with you. But what you fail to realize is there are about 150 games going on at the same time. They're doing all kinds of things. And yes, they're moving the pawn on the board. But it may be moving not because you're right or wrong, but because other people are playing a game that's moving the pawn. So then that begs the question is, the whole idea that we use price as a short-term moniker for our progress is killing us. 
You heard the uh, CIOs. Our board wants us to be long-term, and we want long-term arbitrage strategies, but they want to report every three months. You know why private equities got killed? Because they don't have to report price. You think about it, every quarter, what do they do? Eh, it's worth about a dollar. Next quarter, eh, it's worth about a dollar two. Next quarter, ah, oh, it's worth about 99 cents. And so you see that NAV in your board volume is at a dollar. And you're like, well, that's fine. And then hopefully you get the payoff at the end of three and five years. Our biggest problem is we want to play long horizon arbitrage, but the only way in which we can judge the progress is price, and price is killing us. So the idea I floated, um, and I won't get any traction, is that we need alternative performance benchmarks or alternative ways in which to judge our progress other than price. How does Buffett do it? Look through earnings. If you look at how he manages Berkshire Hathaway, he will tell you what the proportional share of the earnings that he has in Coke and American Express, and he basically will say, as long as my look-through earnings of the stocks that I own are progressing at a satisfactory rate, I'm making progress, despite what the price does. And everybody goes, makes perfect sense. We should be doing that. At least long-horizon arbitrage people should be doing that. Why is it that private equity gets to play that game just because they don't have a market price, and they report the economic progress of their business and price it conveniently for themselves. And we can't play that game. Why? Thomas Kuhn, because we're still playing an old paradigm that's locked in. So be transformative. Go find out a way to play the game differently. I, I'm preaching today, aren't I? Aren't you better settle me down. I haven't even had my second cup of coffee. Settle down, settle down. Tom? Could you provide your perspective on applying these decision models at a macro level versus a more micro level? You, you know, that's, it, the, I just got chilled. The, the thing that scares me the most, and we've been talking about it offline, the biggest risks to the market right now are people decision risks, central bank risks, trade risks. And the way that Bill and I blew up in 2008 was a people risk decision problem we had. We looked at 2008 and said it was 1991. We did an analogy, a metaphor. We looked at the savings and loan crisis in 1991 and said, well, this is how they solved it. And they actually let the equity guys live to fight another day. And he bought, Fetty, and he bought Fannie and Freddie. I wasn't with him at that time and made a killing. We saw 2008 and went, okay, I've seen this movie before. We said, okay, it looks like this is the way it's gonna happen. Even Samuelson and, I mean, Paulson, excuse me, Hank Paulson said in August in a New York Times interview with Gretchen Morganston, in August, before the thing collapsed, that Freddie and Fannie were okay. Afia's got it under control. They'll be fine. It's quoted in the New York Times. Within two months, they nationalized it. We misread the politics. The biggest problem we have today in markets and why I think the markets are flushed, you've been hearing it through the entire conference, everything is a people decision. And if you go through Scott Page's book on models, brilliant book, the hardest model to solve are these independent committee decisions of politicians and central banks. That scares me more than anything because I can't build a profitability statement against it. It's hard. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, Q. Sorry. Thanks. There you go. Um, I just wanted to ask, with respect to, um, I'll call them the high, high, high PE businesses um, that behave like organisms where the network is growing and kind of continues to grow, um, what are the signs when, because um, I guess the problem for some of us is we're using a linear model, trying to value those kind of ex exponential growth um, opportunities. What are the signs when that organism is no longer growing and is in fact, yep. yeah. Great question. And it, it, for me, the ultimate test will be when return on capital starts to degrade. Now, what you're seeing, though, I mean, it really is quite, I mean, everybody's bitching and moaning that the Russell 2000 is not moving. And if the spread between that and the large caps is right. Well, if I look at the economic return of the Russell 2000, it was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, the price of 21 times forward and not growing that fast. Whereas Unilever and Diageo are traded at you know, 24, 25, 27, and they're growing low single digit, uh, I'm sorry, low double digits, high single digits with high returns on capital. Shouldn't they be? <laughs> moving out. What I'm seeing is in the large cap space, it's counterintuitive. The large cap stocks are actually picking up speed. The large cap stocks are actually seeing margin expansion. How do you see that? Well, some of it's technology, some of it's supply chain, and, and we can spend a day on why supply chains are not as important as they used to be. 
But what's happening is, and Holt did this work at Credit Suisse, is the profit margins of multinationals in emerging markets are substantially higher than they are in the U.S. So you have to think about the plant and equipment that they built in Europe and the U.S. 50 years ago. It's not the same plant and equipment that they built in the emerging markets. Much less plant and equipment. Much more efficiency. Much higher margins. So here I've got a Unilever, Diageo, and a Nestle, which you think is a behemoth elephant that can't grow, and they're picking up speed. And the margins are getting high. And the return on capital is getting high because they're selling into a landscape that has better economics and a faster growing unit because of the middle class. So if I can see that move forward, I'm very healthy. If that starts to back down, much less return on capital gets close to the cost of capital, then we're out. The thing that you have to be careful about is, though, um, we're seeing failure rates and it's kind of like real options theory. We're seeing Unilevers and the rest of them starting to fail quicker. Tom Russo, who runs a, a great portfolio, I'm a great admirer of Tom, says, we're getting to see these big companies willing to fail quicker. I mean, the Dollar Shaving Club, is, they went to Gillette and said, do you want us? <laughs> Gillette said, I'll pass. I think the number was 600 million. Like, you know, Gillette, really? You didn't think about this one? So what is Unilever doing? They're doing real options theory. They're willing to fail 10 times to get two right. So you have to calculate their failure rate, knowing what they're doing is trying to block and tackle the innovation coming up from the emerging side. But the outperformance of large cap to small cap is quite evident is that the large caps economically performing better, much less all the new companies that come out that IPO that used to be in the Russell 2000, they're now 50 billion <laughs> or 10 billion or 20 billion coming out of the gates. They're not, it. They're not populating the Russell 2000 anymore. So it's degradation return on capital. About three minutes, anybody? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Cuba. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I want to, since you're talking about all this, a lot of this is active analysis, but obviously we're seeing a growth in passive, yeah. not just with the Vanguard, but also yeah. uh, factor investing. So if that continues to grow, um, how does that change things for active? And I guess at what point do we start seeing distortion that either helps or maybe hurts all this active analysis. Well, I mean, the, the theory is that, you know, that which is passively allocated should create opportunities for mispricing on individual stock selection, people that do the fundamental work. And we can see that. I mean, my biggest problem is my portfolio has got a lot of mo in it, but I still think it's a great value. And I want to continue to own it because I can't predict when the mo comes in and out. Um, the biggest problem with the ETFs and things like that is that, uh, and everybody's, you know, uh, woman this morning, I apologize from JP Morgan, brilliantly said in the corporate bond market, which where that's, that's the problem that we've got is that when these ETFs go south, there's no bid. If people want to come out of ETFs and index fast, that really worries me. What I'm preaching to my people is, when this thing gets sloppy, think about your life, boy, so your Guinness beer. My wife loves Louis Vuitton bags. You know, just kind of think about what you own. We'll get to the other side. But my fear is this rise, structural rise in ETFs and indexes. When the sand pile metaphor happens, and they drop the sand, and that thing starts to cave, I don't know how the bid works when everybody decides to go at the same time, but that's always been a risk in markets. Really, hasn't it? I mean, the fifth, we'll stop here, the fifth biggest decline in the market happened in the fourth quarter of last year. And we all thought it was high frequency and trades. Then I looked up the four before that. One was 29, you got that. You knew what that was happening. The other was in the 60s when the Vietnam War went squirrely. Uh, after that, it was 87, got that. But there were really no computers in 87. That was just called computer grade, but it was, it was not computers. And it was 1991. I thought to myself, those were all faster than the fourth quarter, but they did it before there was internet. <laughs> so things can happen real, real quick. The problem is that's a crowded trade in those indexes, and when they go, everything's gonna go at the same time. There's not that much diversity in the system. And one of the things that Santa Fe teaches you is the system is most stable when it's diverse. System diversity is hugely important for stability. And the system doesn't look very stable, or I should say, the system doesn't look very diverse to me right now, in which case it's probably unstable. So we better stop there, Lauren. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>
Copyright 2019. All rights reserved. This program is designed to give accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. It is distributed with the understanding that CFA Institute is not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, tax investment, or other expert advice. If legal advice or other expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional should be sought.